wow, look at all this. Where'd you get all these people? <laughs> Amazing. Well, welcome everybody, and wherever you are in the overflow room, or I don't know, is that the camera? Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we've been holding our uh, Immerse conference for the students in our, uh, in our school. Hang on, I'm still fussing, fussing with the mic. Is that better? All right. We've been holding, <clears throat> we've been holding our Immerse conference, and um, I was asked to come and speak on healing, so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to speak on healing. Healing. There. Done. <laughs> I, I, think, I think there is, I, though I'm joking around, I think there is something to be said for a uh, simple approach to healing, and I think a lot of times we make it complex. <clears throat> I want to talk with you tonight about the Lord being our healer. This is a relatively newer message of mine, although as it worked out, I did a variant of this last year when we finished Immerse. <clears throat> but I've, um, I've thought about it more since I first wrote it, and so I think I've got some new things to say. Thank you. Anyway, if you've got your Bibles, you can open them to the 15th chapter of Exodus. I know it's old school to preach from the Old Testament, and uh, especially when it comes to healing, but that's what we're going to do. <clears throat> so in the book of Exodus, we have the story of God rescuing his people out of captivity, out of slavery, and um, bringing them to a place of freedom, to the promised land. And this account occurs right after the parting of the Red Sea and the uh, ending of Egyptian tyranny over the Jews. Um, the horse and the rider have been thrown into the sea, as the verse says in 15.1. And when they finish their celebrating and their hallelujahing, uh, they get going. And as they're <clears throat> marching, it says this, uh, chapter 15, verse 22, Then Moses made Israel set out from the Red Sea, and they went into the wilderness of Shur. They went three days in the wilderness and found no water. When they came to Marah, they could not drink the water of Marah because it was bitter. Therefore, it was named Marah. You might think that the Lord wanted to get some point across in that. And the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a log or a tree, and he threw it into the water, and the water became sweet. There the Lord made for them a statute and a rule, and there he tested them, saying, If you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God and do that which is right in his eyes, and give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord, your healer. Then they came to Elim, where there were 70 springs of water, and seven, 12 springs of water, excuse me, and 70 palm trees, and they encamped there by the water. Well, in any relationship of any kind, there is a progressive unfolding of the person that we get to know. I've been married to my wife now for 35 and a half years, and I know her better now than I did, say, after 20 years or 25, and certainly far better than I did after five years or 10. <clears throat> and it's reciprocal. She knows me better than um, she knew me in the early years of our marriage. And so what's happening here in this story is God is revealing himself to the people of Israel, and they probably don't really understand who this God is. In fact, they, they know very little about him. Um, our understanding of God grows over time, as with any relationship, but well, one of the fundamental principles of Christian revelation 
is that whatever revelation God gives us is always an updating but consistent with what he's already taught us prior to that time. So future revelations update, they clarify what we already know without contradicting. And this is, this is a necessary uh, point of the way we understand God uh, because Malachi 3.6 says, I the Lord do not change, or I change not, is usually the way we say it in biblical language, but, but that's the idea. And so this is actually to our benefit because it allows us to build on what we know of God. And not only can we build on what we know of God, we can build on what our forefathers and our foremothers knew of God. Now, this is a very important concept because we live in a time in which I would say most of the boundaries are shifting. And even within Christianity, maybe especially within Christianity, um, people are rewriting the rules. They're rewriting the nature of God. They're trying to redefine what Christianity is. And most of this is just bogus. And this passage here, in a subtle but, but direct way, <clears throat> speaks to that exact issue. We might call it drift. Identity drift, God drift, religion drift. Now, in this story, the Lord makes it clear. His name is the Lord, your healer. Um, but this is not the first time God has revealed himself to the people of Israel. But it is the first time that he's revealed himself definitively since they've gotten out of slavery, since they've gotten out of the house of bondages what the old-fashioned language says if you grew up reading a King James Bible. How else had God revealed himself prior to this time? The first time God ever reveals himself in a covenantal way, that's to say in a relational way, that's to say in a way where he's obligating himself to his own people. The very first time he ever did that was in Genesis chapter 17, verse 1. This is at the call of, his name at the time was Avram, and he would become known as Abraham or Ibrahim. And when Abraham has his encounter with God, he doesn't really have very much information. But when the Lord calls him in Genesis 17, 1, he says, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be upright. Well, that's a revelation. God Almighty is speaking to him. He might have been kind of looking around going, who, what? He could have been doing that. But at the same time, the name by which God called himself in that first revelation, El Shaddai, we sing songs about this, or some Christian singers do anyway. This was actually not a particularly, I don't think it was a particularly helpful name. No disrespect intended, sir. <laughs> but the word El is a word that means God. It's, it's the generic word for God. And I think for a lot of us as Christians, we often throw the word God around, and we're never fully sure, do we mean a name or do we mean a noun? And, you know, it's kind of like a photocopy machine. That's the noun, but the name has come to be Xerox machine, although nobody really Xeroxes anymore. But once upon a time, they did. So is it a name or is it a noun? Well, ale is a... Uh, is a generic descriptor of God that was common throughout the Near East in the days of Abraham. But God tags a word onto the end of it, Shaddai. El means God, but it doesn't tell us anything about who that God is, but Shaddai does. And so the revelation that Abram had was that he was God the All-Powerful, or as we might say, God Almighty. And when he was called, he was called with a specific intention. God said, I am revealing myself to you as God the Almighty, and because of that, you are to walk before me and be upright. The word in Hebrew is tamim. And the word holy there means something like complete, um, whole, and we might even say innocent. So no duplicity, no playing games with me. I'm the Almighty One. I will find you out. And if I wanted to, I could crush you like a bug. So walk before me and be upright. Keep my ways. Follow my paths. 
That's who he was revealing himself to be. And so it's a relationship, uh, we might say, that has, well, an aspect of uh, asymmetry in it. It has an aspect, perhaps, of fear, which isn't all bad. The fear of God is a good thing. We don't like it much in our day, and I would say, if you say that in the wrong circles, a lot of people are going to get up in arms, and they're going to talk about how God is a God of grace, which he is, but he's also the all-powerful one. And so we've, I think in our time, differentially accentuated grace over power. And so what Abraham learns out of this simple summons is that it wasn't enough just to know about God. God himself expected that a particular lifestyle would follow that knowledge. And again, because he is the all-powerful, maybe like a young child learning to respect its father, that knowledge that he's all-powerful, like a dad with a young child, that might keep you in line, so to speak. And so that's kind of where that revelation ends. Well, that revelation came, round numbers, about the year 1800 B.C., and so as we think about that, we're looking back now 38 centuries. A lot of people are saying they're looking for ancient religion. We've got one. We don't need Hinduism. We don't need Buddhism. We just need to get square with this one. And we're looking back, as I said, about rough, round numbers, 38 centuries. And we understand that now when we say El Shaddai, we aren't really calling him a noun God. We're calling him by a name. He is God the Almighty One, and he places a demand upon us that we would walk uprightly, that we would follow his ways scrupulously. Well, the Lord tells Abraham, hey, I've got good news for you. I'm going to give you all this land that you see. Uh, there is one catch, though. Sorry, forgot to tell you about that. Here's the catch. Uh, all of your family and descendants, they're going to go down into Egypt, and they're going to be in captivity for 400 years. And when they come out, they get to have it. So you'll inherit it through them. Uh, you, well, I'm showing it to you so you'll know what the inheritance is, but actually, Abraham, you're never going to lay claim to this land personally. You'll walk the length and breadth of it, but, but that's it. And so part of walking uprightly before this El Shaddai God is to have a long view of things. And we might say to live into the future, and I would say that's part of what we're called to do even today. We're called to live in the presence of the future with a view to the future. And in fact, that's part of what makes us able to be holy people in the here and now because the world with all of its attractions and all of its desires and all of its fleshiness and all of its sin and all of the conflict and everything else it could easily knock you off track it could easily make you wonder if you were crazy to be following such a god and so this man Avram he would be able to say that he understands something of what we're what we're dealing with too so we take the long view because we understand who he is well they've been in captivity for a while and a man named Moses is born, and most of us have heard the story perhaps in Sunday school. It's not a story we tend to preach on very much. Modern Christianity just doesn't like these old Bible stories all that well. But anyway, in the book of Exodus chapter 3, uh, Moses is born, and his mother recognizes there's something unusual about this boy. There's something special, and it's not just that she's uh, her boy it's that there's something of God around him but he's only a baby and so there's a there's a sentence that's been put out a decree by Pharaoh and uh, this baby's life is at risk like all baby boys and so rather than submitting to that unrighteous decree she hides him in a basket and puts some pitch or some tar around the outside and puts him in the Nile River and lets him float along. She follows it a bit of a distance, sort of keeping an eye out to see what will happen. And as it turns out, none other than Pharaoh's daughter comes down to the river to bathe. And she finds the baby in a basket, and she has compassion on the child. And uh, what do you know? Here's a Hebrew woman nearby. And so she 
brings her in as a servant to take care of, as it works out, her own baby. Sometimes there's just lucky circumstances in life. What are you going to do? <laughs> but anyway, uh, Moses is raised as an Egyptian prince. Disney's made a lot of money on that story, Prince of Egypt. He's raised as an Egyptian prince, and as he is now an adult, uh, speaking fluent Egyptian, understanding the ways of Egypt itself, all of the ins and outs of the royal palace. As we all know, there, there comes a day when uh, he sees one of the Egyptian taskmasters beating one of the Hebrew slaves. And whether it's a sense of his own Hebrewness or it's a sense of righteousness and justice within him, maybe it's some mixture of both, he kills the taskmaster. Pharaoh finds out about it. He's been had. He's not even supposed to be alive. All these Hebrews of this age should be dead. Pharaoh doesn't want them alive lest they rise up and become an army in his own country and overthrow him. Uh, Moses is forced to flee, and off he goes. And he spends about 40 years in the wilderness. And what's happening with Moses at this point is he's living on one single thread of revelation, and that revelation is that He's one of those people who's one of those El Shaddai people. He serves the all-powerful one, but he doesn't really know very much more about this God because there isn't much more that's been revealed. You think you've got it tough when you're having dark night of the soul. <laughs> well, after 40 years of wandering around in the desert, the Lord apparently has gotten some of Egypt out of Moses, and maybe he's possibly useful in God's hand and so one day as he's going through the wilderness he sees a burning bush and you know there's a lot of things that people say about this burning bush I think it was literally a burning bush I think it was on fire and it was doing exactly that it was burning now it's not all that unusual to um, see well it's I won't that's not quite even the right way to say it this is not a one-of-a-kind event but it is a revelatory event. Because if you spend a lot of time in deserts, not that I would expect people from Ohio to get this, <laughs> but, but I live in a, a desert area. And when I was younger and thinner and more energetic and less busy, um, I used to spend a lot of time out in the desert, sometimes praying, but more commonly with a shotgun in my hands hunting wild quail. And what I learned doing that is that there are times, not super numerous, but they happen, where you'll get a bush burning in the desert and there's no particular reason why it should be burning, it just is. Maybe there's been a dry lightning strike and uh, it's lit the bush on fire and so it's burning. Other times maybe it just spontaneously combusts because when the temperature gets above a certain level, the resins within the bush, not unlike a pine tree or a eucalyptus tree or something like that, they will just spontaneously burst into flames. So we don't know how this bush happened to be burning, but Moses, Moses sees this bush, and it says that he's leading the flock from one side of the wilderness over to the other. But as he's going along, for whatever reason this day, the, the burning bush catches his, catches his attention. Probably it's because they didn't have television and there was not a lot going on out there in the desert other than minding the sheep. And so Moses is in need of a bit of entertainment or distraction. And as he's going along, this bush is burning. And he says, I will turn aside and see this sight. And so there's something of Moses that we see in this that he's a bit inquisitive. He's, he's paying attention to what's around him. And so he turns toward the bush. And as he gets near to it, um, the Lord speaks to him and he says, Moshe, Moshe, put off your shoes, for the place you are standing is holy. Now it's interesting, this is a, basically the same idea that Avram had been confronted with. Walk before me and be upright, be holy, and now, Moses, you're on holy ground. And he does, and now, now and only now, as he peers into the bush and as he sees the fire burning as he looks suddenly seeing becomes perception it's a very important concept in the hebrew scriptures and for anybody who's prophetic everyone knows it's a very important concept 
you can see without perceiving. Jesus talked about this. Or you can see and perceive. And so it's only as he has prepared his heart and I'd say his body, literally putting himself into a position of reception by taking off his shoes. And I might suggest that that was not a comfortable thing to do because the sand is hot and the shoes are protective. And so maybe not unlike Isaiah with his lips getting burned by a coal, only Moses is getting his feet burned. You know, sometimes when God wants to give you revelation, things get kind of hot and uncomfortable. So the Lord speaks to him now because he's ready to hear. And he says, Haya, Asher, Haya. I am who I am. Now we don't know how he heard that. I am who I am. I am who I am. It's not completely clear, but it's been 500 years since Abraham has had this revelation of El Shaddai. And now the next layer of revelation is coming. Think about that, 500 years with no revelation. You know, the, the scriptures tell us that there would come a time when there'd be a famine for the word of God. They'd had them before. And um, between Malachi and the coming of Jesus, it was 400 years. So this is a little longer, but it's in approximately the same range. But it's a limited revelation. It shows us a single aspect of God's nature. I am means I exist. I am alive. I am present. And in, in this revelation, God is saying, not only am I almighty, but I'm sovereign and self-sufficient. Now, that's actually an interesting idea that you might not have thought about because I think to a typical Westerner, especially if you have any Christian background, you assume that almighty means self-sufficient, but it actually does not. And Moses, having been raised in Egypt and knowing the Egyptian gods and pantheon, um, there were gods who were all-powerful, but they were not self-sufficient. They needed something to keep them going. And there were other gods that were self-sufficient, but they were not all-powerful. So now we have the joining of these two concepts, but on the other hand, what are you going to do with all that? And so Moses kind of lives with that revelation, and the Lord says, when you go to the people of Israel, he asks the question, who am I going to tell them sent me? Do I tell them it's El Shaddai again? Oh, no, no, no. You tell them that Haya Asher Haya is the one who sent you. I am who I am is the one who is sending to you. Declare that revelation to them. Of course, it doesn't go all that well with Moses' initial encounter with Pharaoh, and all it really does is kick up a lot of opposition. And so a third revelation comes just before they get busted out. Now, there is some time that passes here in this exchange with Pharaoh. It's not completely clear from the text, but it's, it's not just a day or so. And this third revelation comes essentially fairly rapidly on the heels of the revelation that God is sovereign and self-sufficient. And so now he clarifies that revelation. They knew him as Ale, but they had never known him as, well, it depends on how you word it in Hebrew. It could be Yahava, it could be Jehovah, but whichever way you render it, it means the self-existent one. Now, self-existent is different from self-sufficient because self-sufficient means self-sustaining, but self-existent means I have no beginning and no end. And by the way, we are still struggling with that exact concept. Everything that the Webb telescope is giving us of the universe, they still are trying to figure out the Big Bang. What caused it? Where did it come from? How did it happen? Well, it all happened because of Yahaba the self-sufficient one, who also happens to be Haya Asher Haya, the self-sufficient one, who happens also to be El Shaddai, the all-powerful one. We are still struggling with this revelation. We don't really understand this God. He is in many ways a mystery to us. And in some ways, he's terrifying as well. 
Now later on, it's not quite yet, it's actually after they've gotten out of Egypt and so on, the Lord is going to show them many aspects of himself. He's going to show himself to be Rahum, merciful or compassionate. He's going to show himself to be Hanum, gracious, and he's going to show himself to be Arek, which means long-suffering, or he puts up with a lot of guff from us. He's going to show himself as that too, but that hasn't happened yet. All we have right now is that he's the almighty, he's the self-sufficient, and he is the self-existent. And it's really with that knowledge that they come out of Egypt. And all you can say is, it's a good thing when a God like that is on your side. And I, as I said, we, we still wrestle with these concepts. I think this is a very important part of what we have to come to terms with with God as Christians in the year 2023. Not a lot has changed in 38 centuries, or knock off 500 years, 33 centuries. Not a lot has changed. We still don't really get all of that. We like to cut corners and maybe redefine him at times. We can certainly sing the songs and have all that kind of language, but I don't know if we really get our heads wrapped around it. And so this one who is that all-powerful and self-existent and self-sufficient one, this one gets them out of Egypt and they cross the Red Sea. And he undertakes for them. And you might have thought when the ocean came crashing in on the Egyptian army that they would understand that this God was on their side. You might have thought that when he brought ten plagues down on Egypt, that they would have understood that this God was on their side. But people can be thick-headed. It'd be easy to say, ah, oh, those Jews. But listen, we're no better. And so they're, they're not totally sure what to do with all of this, but what they do know is this guy Moses, he seems to be a pretty hot rock prophet. He's got a staff that'll turn into a snake. When he needs to perform miracles, they happen. So we'll just listen to Moses, and we'll let him tell us all about it. And this is why, as they're journeying through the wilderness, when Moses initially is called, excuse me, called up on the mountain, he wants them to come with him, and they're like, no, no, Moses, you handle it. You, we'll just stay down here, and you go up there, and the mountain's on fire, and you can talk to that God. You tell us what he says. Well if that's what you want. And so they've gone through the Red Sea. They've done their singing and dancing and shouting and hallelujahing. And Moses says, all right, let's set out. We've got to get going. We've got a promised land to reach. And they begin marching. And they no sooner begin marching, and they hit the wilderness of Shur. Now, the word shur in Hebrew means the wall, and uh, anybody who's a marathoner understands what it means to hit the wall. Well, they ran out of gas. They ran out of energy. They ran out of, well, they ran out of everything, and most particularly, they ran out of water. And so they get to this wilderness called shur, and the Lord had said when he was calling them out of Egypt, they're going to go three days into the wilderness to worship me. And it says they journeyed three days into the wilderness and there they found no water. Now, God has funny ways of getting us to worship him. Yeah. He does, right? And in this case, he, as it were, pulled the water out from underneath them. <laughs> and, uh, and so now they come to this place called Marah. Marah is a Hebrew word that means bitter, and so it appears to be okay. It appears that all is well. It looks like there's water to drink, but you can't actually drink this water. It's bitter water or bad water or maybe as they called it um, in the days of the Old West, black water. And if you drank this water, it would make you sick or it would kill you. So they come to Marah and they could not drink the water of Marah because it was bitter and therefore it was called Marah. Well, why does God bring them to a place called Marah? Because not unlike what he'd done with Moses, he had to get Egypt out of them now that they were out of Egypt. And part of what he did, it's almost like a prophetic action, is God put this water in front of them, not because he hated them, he loved them. But, but you know, we make this mistake ourselves. And 
he did it because he had to show them a reflection of what was in them. They were bitter people. They were angry. They were, they'd been enslaved for 400 years. Now, I'm not, I don't, don't anyone get riled up at what I'm about to say, but I just want to point something out. From 16, 1620, 1607, from the founding of the first um, European settlements in the New World, to the abolition of slavery in the United States in 1865, that's a period of time of round numbers, we'll call it 250 years. We, we can do the math more precisely, but 250 is an easier number just to grab onto. That's a terrible amount of time, and there's no excuse for it, and I'm not in any way justifying it. But I am saying this, if you think that was damaging and destructive to those who were enslaved, what do you think 400 years would do? That's a whole other 150 years, and that's what these people had been enslaved. You think they were embittered? You think they got problems? You think they've got, I don't know what we might say, identity issues? Do you think they viewed themselves only as slaves? Yes, yes, and yes. In fact, not real much later on from this, when they get near the Holy Land, before they ultimately are turned back, they send out their spies into the Holy Land. They see everything that's there. This God that's the Almighty, this God that's the self-sufficient, self this God that is the one who is um, self-sustaining, this God who's on their side, this God tells them, go in and take the land, and they're like, we can't. We look like grasshoppers in our own eyes. That's what we call an identity problem. And it's rooted in the bitterness of who they are. And so God allows them to see this bitterness, to taste this bitterness, to experience this bitterness in order that they would say, we don't want any more bitterness. We want change. We want life change. We want to be different people. If that's who you are, we want to know you that way. That's what we want. And so God will allow those things in order that it will drive you to your knees in worship. We see this in the story of the Syrophoenician woman when Jesus goes on a vacation. And he's along the Lebanese coast between Tyre and Sidon. And she comes, she's got a demonized daughter. And she calls out and asks for help and Jesus rebuffs her. And as the story unfolds, I'm not going to go there because that's not my story tonight, but as the story unfolds, she initially says, well, you should help me anyway. Help me, Lord. It's an interesting turn of phrase for a woman from Syrophoenicia where they don't worship the Hebrew God and they don't know the Jewish Messiah, but she's using the language of Lord, and it shows that she is somehow starting to make a turn toward him. She's not all the way there yet, and here's the problem. She's doing what she's doing. Why? Because she wants to get something from this God. Around the world, in many cultures, including American culture, people will sometimes worship whoever the God is that they're worshiping, thinking they will basically trick him into giving them what they want. It becomes a form of negotiation. And that's what this woman is doing. She's negotiating with him calling him Lord. And then later she bows down and worships him. And ultimately she gets Jesus to say, go, your daughter has been healed. There's something of all of that kind of behavior and, uh, well, game playing that's in the human soul. I don't think it's unique to Jewish people. I don't think it's unique to Syrophoenician people. And so here they are in the wilderness of Shur. They've got no water. They're thirsty, and they are in dire need. And so they did what any good, devout people would do. They grumble. <laughs> they complain. And they grumble against Moses. The prophet who rescued us is the prophet who caused us our problem. And so now they're angry with Moses, and they say, what shall we drink and so he cries out to the Lord, and as he's crying out, and again, we, it would be great to see the video of this, but we don't have the benefit of this, right? Moses, is, where is he doing this? Is he, does he like climb up on a mountain or something out there in the wilderness, or is it all flat land, so he just doesn't have anywhere to go? He's out in the desert, or is he there by the waters of Marah, and everybody knows there's no water there that's worth drinking, so they've all withdrawn, and he's sitting there by a, a toxic pool, 
uh, but at least he's got some privacy. We don't quite know exactly where and how it happened, whether it was visionary or he just lifted up his eyes and saw. But anyway, somehow the Lord showed him a log or a tree, and it's right there, and he throws it into the water, and when he does, the water becomes sweet. Well, this speaks to us, and, and all of the early fathers followed this line of exegesis. Um, this speaks to us of the cross of Christ and how he takes our bitterness of life, our bitterness of soul, and everything that has corrupted and twisted us, and he makes it sweet. This is, this is really where the work of redemption begins. And so they, he, this, this thing gets thrown into the water, this log or this tree, and now the Lord is becoming more earnest about it, and he makes for them a statute and a rule. He says, okay, here's how we play ball, guys. It's not enough for you just to have a string of three names by which you know me. That, that's good for the other nations of the world, but it's my intention to reveal myself to you more deeply. It's my intention to show you something that is more profound than anyone else on the earth knows about me. But if you're going to know me in this way, you have to know me in the way that I'm willing to be known, not by your own rules. And so he makes a statute, he makes a rule, and he tests them. This is not the only test that they will have. It's the first test that's mentioned as they come out of Egypt. This is different from being tempted, by the way. God can tempt no one is what the Scripture tells us in the book of James. But he will test us. He wants to know what are we made of, what's inside of us. And what it's coming down to is, okay, if I'm going to tell you who I really am, then I need to know that you're going to follow me as I really am. And so when he tests them, he gives them a, a series, and it ultimately turns into the writings of Moses that become the Mosaic Law and the Covenant. But he gives them this statute and a rule, and he says, if you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God. Why might he say that? Because probably they're not going to listen very diligently. And more than that, they're going to listen to some other voice, maybe their own. Because... This is what people do. We always think we have a better idea than he does. But if you will pay attention and you will listen to the voice of your God and you will do what is right in his eyes, not your own eyes. You don't get to make your own rules here. You've got to follow my rules. This is the nature of covenant. In fact, all of this language is reminiscent of what went on in the Middle East at that time. They call it a suzerain vassal treaty. It's a bunch of big words that nobody knows what they mean anymore. But the suzerain was the Lord, and the vassal was the servant. And so it's a treaty between the Lord and the servant. And the Lord says, I'll take care of you, I'll protect you, I'll feed you, as long as you follow these guidelines. And that's, this is the beginning of that. It gets unpacked further in the Mosaic Code. But anyway, here we go. So God says, you have to do what is right in the eyes of your Lord, not, not in your own eyes. And if you'll give ear to his commandments and then keep all of his statutes, then I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians. That sounds like a pretty good deal, doesn't it? And by the way, why might he be talking about diseases? Well, because probably this water that they drank in Mara, whether it had parasites in it, uh, whether it was making them ill, maybe some, maybe some were dying from it. But what God is saying is, I will bless what you consume. I will bless your intestines. I'll bless your stomach. That's an interesting point because we live in an age where stomach digestive orders, intestinal problems are exploding everywhere. And do you know why it's happening? Because people want to play by their own rules. Because they think they're serving God according to the way he wants to be served and they're making it up as they go along. And when you violate those commandments certain things can happen to you. This is a true statement. We see a lot of people get healed of stomach conditions, and a bunch of you are going to get healed of them tonight. Things like irritable bowel and spastic colon and uh, you know, various food allergies and whatnot, these things happen because people have stepped away from the ways of God, and over time they just drift. They, they don't even realize they're off track. They think they're doing great. So God says, I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians, 
because I am the Lord your healer. Well, this is his fourth revelation of himself. And this is quite different from the first three, don't you agree? He's not just all powerful. He's not just self-sustaining. He's not just self-sufficient. He actually takes all of that and he bends it right down into a one human being and he says, I care about the fact that you're sick and I want you to be well. Now that should make everybody want to shout up and stand up and shout and say hallelujah. It should also tell us that there is, there is a, an unlimited amount of resource available in the throne room of grace directed at us for this purpose of healing. And by the way, this is the old covenant and we have a new and better one. Now for a lot of you this is causing mental block and cognitive dissonance, I'm aware. Because you're like, that ain't my lived experience. Bingo. Because if that's not your lived experience, how well do you really know this God who calls himself Jehovah Rapha or Yahava Rapha? Maybe not so well as you thought. Well, I know Jesus and that's enough. Okay, stay with that idea for just a moment. God sees our weaknesses. He sees our sicknesses. He sees our sufferings. He responds with compassion, grace, and mercy which those are coming up in just a few chapters forward from here. We won't get there tonight, but, but it's coming. And so this point of self-revelation is quite personal. And when we see this, we understand that this God who could name himself anything he wants to, because he is all-powerful, because he is self-sustaining, because he is self-sufficient, this God decides in the fourth revelation he gives of himself to call himself healer. I mean, why, why didn't he call himself the one who hung the heavens? Why didn't he call himself the great parter of the waters? He'd just shown them that he was that. But instead, he calls himself the healer. And not just the healer, your healer. I am the Lord, your healer. Wow. Think about that. Someone's getting healed right now. You're over here in this section. It's your left hip. You've had a problem in your hip for a long time. It doesn't work right. It feels like arthritis, but it's not arthritis. Who's got it? You're over here in this section. Uh, you're the wrong hip, but we'll pray for your hip anyway. You gotta take it back to Kmart and exchange the hip. Did you put up your hand? You're a right hip too. You're the left hip. Is, is that you? You've got a left hip. Well, you're not exactly in the section, and neither is he. Are, are you the one? You're playing chicken with me. That's what you're doing. This is Ohio. You guys still play games like that, don't you? All right. All right, you and now are you a left hipper, but you've used a slow to respond? Yeah, Robert's pointing at you. So people do this with me all the time. They, they play chicken. <laughs> they try and back me into a corner. The Lord is your healer. Do you want the Lord to heal your hip? Okay, and ma'am, you over here on the aisle, you're, you're close enough for government work. The power of God is falling on her right now. Those of you around her see her vibrating. The Spirit of the Lord is healing her right now in the middle of the sermon. We speak to the hip in the name of Jesus, and this one here too. We speak to the left hip in the name of Jesus. Receive the healing of the Lord, your healer. Your healer. Not some generic healer, your healer. Take him as your healer. Reach out, let the healing of God flow into you. There, the power's falling over her body right now on the aisle. Catch her, don't let her fall. In the, we name this in Jesus' name. Receive the healing of God right now. Yes, yes, there it is. There it is, let it go right through your body. And let him straighten your spine too. It's crooked at the bottom. Lord, we speak to that scoliosis and command it to straighten in Jesus' name.
Do it now. Now, those of you that had the right hips, all you dyslexic people, stand up. All right, are you ready? Are you ready? Okay. Susan Hughley's ready. Father, we ask for these four with their right hips as well. Because you are gracious and compassionate, and as far as the east is from the west, as far as the left is from the right, we speak to these hips now, and we speak the blessing of the Lord, and we say, the Lord is your healer. Receive the power of the living God upon your hip. In Jesus' name. The woman who was the first to respond, who's all the way in the back, somebody be near her. She's going to crumble in a moment. The power of God's coming right over her body. That's it. Here it comes. Father, we thank you. Let the healing of... There we go. Let the healing power that you spoke of, that you are Yahava Rapha, let it come upon them in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now, you know, when the Lord busts into a sermon and interrupts the preacher, you know he's in a hurry. You know he really means it, right? Now, stay on these four. Even though I said left, they responded in faith. Stay on them. Pray for them. The Lord's going to heal them too. How are you doing back there? The, you kind of crumbled under the power. How do you feel? All right, that's good. Now, there was another woman beyond you, Teresa, this woman here. How's she doing? Better? Okay, that's good. Better or good? Better, but not, not all the way good. Okay, keep working on her. And we have this other one right here who is a little bit shy. She's still shaking and quaking and baking. Can we get one of our students to go pray for her? Because she's, she's definitely under the power of God. And the Lord is, is serious about this hip. Yeah. We'll come back and check on them all in a bit here. So I forget where I was exactly, but it was something along the line. Are, are you getting healed too? You're standing up. Did you just decide to jump in? Oh, you've got a right. <laughs> Go get her, Chris. <laughs> I like it, though. This, this is what I call faith, right? People are like, never mind that left hip thing. I'm going for the right hip. Never mind that he said it's right in this section. I'm over here. I'm going for it anyway. I like it. <laughs> This is not some stale denominational church from your conference, Pat. <laughs> I won't name the denomination out of respect, but yeah, okay. So like I was saying, this God could have called himself anything he wanted to, and he said, I am the Lord, your healer. He's your healer. He's your healer. Are you ready to take that at face value? Because, you know, part of what bitterness does, part of what disappointment does, is it loads you down with, yeah, but, yeah, but this is different. Yeah, but this is me. Yeah, but you don't know what I have wrong with me. Yeah, but it can't be that easy. Yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. And it's not yeah, but, dab, but, do, John. That's different, right? So the yeah, but's got to get out of us. And, and that's what they're saying, really. Yeah, but he cut, parted the sea. Yeah, but he took care of ten plagues. Yeah, but he did all that. But what's he going to do now? And so you can see the problem that they had is the problem that we have. Well, the Lord says, I am Yahava Rapha. And I want you to know me this way. And I only have a couple of things that you have to do. 
You've got to listen to me. <laughs> and then you've got to live what I tell you to do. And if you will do that, everything will come good. The ways of God are not complex. When Avram was called, the Lord just said, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be upright. And Avram believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. He took it at face value. He got rid of the yabbat in his own life, and suddenly he became the father of a great nation. He didn't see it right away, but that's what ultimately happened for him. We live in a time, we live in an age where everything is open to debate. We distrust our leaders. We distrust our religious leaders. We distrust the book that we say we live by. Everything is clouded with doubt and uncertainty and this, this bitterness, this thing called mara inside of us. And mara is fundamentally a condition where we say, life is hard and then you die. And even in a land of great blessing and abundance, like Ohio. <laughs> Chris is right down here. He says, thank you, Lord. <laughs> even in a land of abundance, it's easy to get drawn into that, isn't it? And so at one point, not here, but at one point, they're dealing with the same basic set of issues that didn't all get worked out at the first round at Mara. And they're like, we've got a great idea. Let's go back to Egypt. Wow, just what I want to do, go back to slavery. Why? Well, because we had enough leeks and onions and garlic. And so with all, what's that? Don't forget the what? Don't forget the garlic, yeah. So we have all that to eat. And so we're living now for our own pleasure, our own belly. We'd rather be in slavery and have our belly full and live in freedom yes. right. and live under this one who will be our provision. So all of this happens at Shur, where they hit the wall. And they had to make a decision. Would they worship the Lord? That's what it comes down to. Three days in, God said they will worship me. So there's a prophetic dimension to that which he had said. Yeah, they will worship me. They will. Uh, but it might not be their first choice. They will, they will come to it. I will lead them to that more, more beneficial conclusion. And so he's beginning to take all the Egypt out of them. Well, once they've gotten through all of this grumbling and all of this bitterness at Marah, and the, the, the earliest uh, premonition of the cross has been shown to them, that there would be something of healing available through the cross. Now they leave, sure. They, they pass beyond the wall. And you know, when you hit a wall, you've only got a couple of choices. You can go over it. You might dig under it, but it probably has deep foundations. Or you can run along it parallel one way or the other until you find some breach in the wall. Then you can move on. So they've been redirected is what's happened. That's what God did when he took them to sure. One of the ways he will do that with you is he will redirect you. And you might hit the wall sometimes with sickness. That's what can happen. Well, they've been redirected. And as they move on, having been told, I will make myself known to you as Yahava Rapha, they come to a place called Elim where there were 12 springs of water and 70 palm trees. And they encamp there by the water. Well, Elim means palms. And one of the lessons we see in this is that all tests end eventually. But generally, they only end when we pass them. So it's to our own enlightened self-interest to, we could say, yield. But one friend of mine years ago used to say, die quickly. Just die quickly. Let your flesh die. The sooner it dies, the better it gets good. So I'll say yield because we don't like the language of die, but, but just give up. Just give up. Now, yes, Lord, what you want. That's, uh, okay, I'm there. I'm good. Yes, whatever you want, sir. So tests eventually end, but only once we've passed them. 
And then once we pass the test, we come to a place of blessing. When they came to Elim, there were 12 springs of water. How many tribes were there? Hmm, every tribe got its own water. And before, they're just trying to get by with one little spring or something called Mara. How many palm trees are there? Seventy. How many elders were there that the Holy Spirit was going to come down upon in Numbers 11 who worked with Moses? Seventy. Hmm, does this sound like abundant provision? Yes. Does it sound like God proving to them yet again, I am with you? Yes. And by the way, bonus, palm trees in that part of the world don't grow coconuts. Those grow in the, in the tropics, in the Pacific. Do you know what kind of palm trees exist in that part of the world? Dates. And dates are sweet. So they're exchanging their bitterness for sweetness. Now, this is all happening to them in real time. It's part of the parable and mystery of life. But the Lord likes to work parables and mysteries in our lives. And you might be in the midst of a literal living parable being unfolded, but you want to be careful that you don't get stuck at Mara and thereby miss the uh, happy conclusion, which God has just down the road for you. And so now that they're out of Egypt, and Egypt is coming out of them, they rest at this place of pools and palms. Now, you know, it's interesting when Jesus came. The scripture says in Matthew 121, he was named Jesus because he would save his people from their sins. But the word there, saved, it's a much bigger word than salvation. We used to teach this pretty heavily in the vineyard. I'm sure, John, knowing you, you probably still do teach this. But there'd be many places that have kind of lost this idea he would sozo them from their sins, which means save, heal, deliver, transform, uh, change, bring them into the realm of shalom, wholeness, completeness. And so but he was named Jesus for that reason. So the healing ministry of Jesus becomes our father's, I'm not going to call him God, because do we mean the noun or the name? I'm going to call him father, because that's what Jesus said to call him. His name is father, and he is nominally a God. And I don't mean nominally like in some minor form. I mean the noun is God. So our Father decided to show us graciously and kindly the restoration that he had for an entire wayward nation. Not unlike this nation that he'd rescued out of Egypt, except by the time of Jesus, we're 1,400 years beyond this story and they've once again forgotten God. They're living in a new dimension of bitterness. They're living under Roman rule, and they've got all kinds of Roman and Greek gods all around them, and they've got just to the north of them um, their neighbors who had departed from the ways of the Lord and followed the Assyrian gods some centuries before after there had been a conquest that had occurred. We know those people as the Samaritans. All these people are wrapped up in their own versions of who is God, what is God, which God, religious pluralism. They don't really know who God is, and Jesus comes with the idea, birthed in the mind of the Father, that he would rescue them, he would sozo them, he would save them from all of their waywardness. And in so doing, what he shows is that Exodus 15, 26 is still in effect. It's an old covenant story, but as I said at the beginning of this message, we have a new one and a better covenant. So how about not just not putting diseases on you, how about keeping you free of sickness? How about letting you live to a ripe old age? How about letting your body not get the usual aches and pains and cramps? How would you like that one? How about being able to eat anything you want to, well, subject to weight gain how would you like to have that that's a better covenant isn't it yeah I think it is and I think that's what the Lord intends for us although we get really nervous when we start talking about divine health because we're like well let's not get too extreme here we don't even live in divine healing well let's start there and then we'll move on to something that's better because we do have a better covenant 
You know, Moses had a, the deepest revelation of his era, and he's called the greatest prophet of the Old Testament. And it says of Moses that when he died at 120 years of age, his strength was not diminished and his vigor was not abated. And also his eye was undimmed, which means even he, he didn't have presbyopia. Right? <laughs> I had a meeting in Sydney. I wasn't preaching on this passage. I had a meeting in Sydney, Australia a few years ago, and 50 people got healed and threw their glasses away, left them on the altar. In a vineyard church, by the way. Somehow I got left behind. So I sat down by the waters of Marah, and I gnashed my teeth. All right, so when Jesus comes... He is called Jesus because he would rescue, he would sozo, he would return divine order and balance to their lives. Not just to their bodies, but to every dimension. To their crazy minds, to their broken sexuality, to their emotional fragility, and on it goes. He came with that objective, and it was assigned to them with that name that Exodus 15, 26 is still in place the Lord still wants to be your healer yes. Yes. not your neighbors yours yes. yours yes. yours yes. yeah <laughs> the peanut gallery is acting up down here I'll take it man I'll take it let me tell you let me just tell you a story in closing there was a peer, I just came out with a new book. I would have had copies with me tonight, but at our Immerse conference, we sold three boxes of them, and there was none left to bring. But you can buy it on Amazon, or you can, you can go to our Orbis store and buy them. Brian will go crazy fulfilling the orders, but he'll do it. Um, but anyway, they're available. Yeah, there he is back there. He's giving me the high sign. I will go crazy, it's true. But you know, the Lord wants to be your healer, Brian. <laughs> Anyway, uh, so I've got some stories in that book of, of my journeys in Indonesia. And there was this time we went to this island and had right around 5,000 people living on it. Indonesia is a nation of islands, and every one of them is disconnected from the others. In a few places where they may be somewhat close to each other, they might, might run some cables under the, under the ocean, and they might have a power plant over here and run power over there, but mostly not. So every island is kind of its own little thing. We went to this one island, and um, there was around 5,000 people living there. And at the ministry time, um, we had a word for deaf people, and 10 deaf people came up to receive prayer. And maybe like Elijah throwing water on the sacrifice on Mount Carmel, we asked for 10 people who had never prayed for anyone to be healed of anything. And so we had 10 deaf and 10 people to pray. And, uh, and then we instructed them how to pray. And all, the, all this is being done from English into Indonesian. And then we prayed. And immediately four of them were healed. And, you know, that's pretty good. I mean, in the U.S., we'd say, wow, 40% yield? That's amazing, especially on something like deaf ears. Because what happens when you hear deaf ears? You're like... I don't know. Uh, and, you know, if this doesn't look, because this doesn't work, God's going to be embarrassed. There's Mara right there. That catch in your soul right there, that's Mara. I tell you the story because I want you to identify it in yourself if you've got it. Well, so four get healed. So we go back down the row, and we had the translator working with us, but we asked each one, each one a little differently than the other one. Are you mad at somebody? Are you angry with somebody? Are you bitter with somebody? You have unforgiveness. However it was asked, we were asking that question of the remaining six, and every single one of them had mara. Every one of them was angry or unforgiving towards somebody. And so we explained to them that they needed to let this go and release it. Jesus wanted to heal them, but they did have to follow his statutes and his rule. 
and one of them is a simple one. You've got to let people off the hook. Even when they're dastardly scoundrels and you don't really want to, still we do it. And so all six of them prayed a simple prayer to release. The, the Indonesian people are very, I don't want to make them sound like they're naive and stupid, but they're very simple people. They, they will take what you say at face value. And so they did what we said they had to do. They, they forgave the people they were angry with, and six out of six were healed. Boom. Well, this thing of Marah obviously is a pretty major thing, and it's not just a thing in Ohio, it's a thing in Indonesia. By the way, in the heels of that, we had a kind of a big giant healing line, and kind of everybody in the church lined up, and we started praying for everybody in a pretty fast-moving line. It's not very vineyard, John, but it was what we needed to do in the context, so it was what we did. And so we prayed for all these people. And afterward, we went around, and there were hundreds of them, with the same translator. And the, the, it's Indonesia. They, they don't have particularly anywhere to go or anything to do. It's, it's a simple society. Their biggest job is going to be to launch the boats in the morning and go fishing or go open the shops that they have on this remote island. And this is not big city with a big high-paying corporate job and all the rest of it, planes to catch, people to meet, things to do, power lunch to get to. And so, anyway, um, we, we asked them while people just stuck around and waited. And of the hundreds of people we had prayed for that night, every single person got healed. Every single person got healed. Because the Lord is your healer. Yeah. So, anyway, finish the story out. All of a sudden, the church starts emptying. So my friend and I, we look at the pastor. We're like, where are the people going? Is, is, did the service just end and we didn't know it? And he said, no, they're all going to get their friends. <laughs> and so they all brought their friends, and all of them got healed, who then went and got their friends, and they all got healed. And sometime toward dawn, we realized that in the praying for the sick, we'd also asked them if they knew Jesus, we had led the entire island to faith. Oh, 5,000 people on that island, or maybe it was, you know, 5,100, but it's right around 5,000. This story comes from about uh, 12 years ago. Um, but, but, the, but the bottom line is, God was their healer, and he was showing them that he wanted to save them in every dimension, not just the physical illnesses that they were most acutely aware of, but also the need of their soul to find the bread of life, the water of life itself. And I want to suggest to you that while God wants to heal a lot of people in here tonight, we already had a demonstration. By the way, how are all of you doing? If you've got prayer over here and you, you're improved, wave one hand, but if you're fully healed, wave two. No fully healed? Okay. Yeah, okay. All right, so I'm, I'm, taking, I'm taking account over here, including you right-hipped people. Yeah, Susan's putting up a hand. Okay, she's putting up a hand. What about our... Friend, oh, from Immerse, she's still vibrating, so she's cooking still. <laughs> how, how are you? Did you get prayer? It's totally gone. All right, and you're the one with a walker. Okay, that's fine. So that's what I'm talking about. It's a little harder in Ohio because we have our own kind of version of this that blocks us, but we're trying to break through that and find ourselves in something that more nearly approximates biblical Christianity. That's what we're trying to get to. Well, the Lord is your healer. Can you accept that? Can you believe it? Then there's going to be a bunch more healing in the room tonight. Now, I'm on a, I have a few more words that I want to give, um, and it may be that some of my team have some words that they want to give, so I'll give them a chance too. I keep being drawn over here to this side of the room. I don't know why. 
and I have a feeling it is the left, most definitively the left side. Um, I think there's somebody who's got something going on right in here, and this would generally be the spleen, or maybe kind of the tail end of the pancreas, but usually over here we think of the spleen. Is there someone over here who has a blood condition, or in the spleen, is that you? And is it your spleen? Ovarian cancer, and it's affecting your spleen. Help is on the way. Okay, get after it, Robert. Light her up. I also think there's somebody sitting. I think you're back in here, but you, you could be maybe... But it seems like you're up against the wall, maybe literally in life, but, but I think you're seated against the wall. And you've got some weird thing going on with the top of your spine, and it's giving you both pain in the neck, but also headaches. And there's something that's misaligned or adjusted. Who is that? that you. You're right in my line of sight. You're just not as far back as I thought. We'll, we'll take you where you are, because you're right in line with where I was expecting to see you. I just thought you were all the way back. All right, so who wants to pray for her? You're gonna, it's going to look good on your heavenly report card. <laughs> What's your name? My name is Karen. Karen? All right. You're being surrounded by Orbis students. Yeah. All right, Father, we lift up Karen right now. And Lord, we thank you that she has responded. And we thank you that even as they touch her, your power is hitting her. And so now we say to the spine, be straight in Jesus' name. That's it. We command that spine, straighten up. And we break the power of these headaches that have been coming all the way to the top of the head. Go in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Wow. Chris, do you have somebody under your arm? You look like you're holding someone else. Oh, no, okay. I thought he had someone like this, but he doesn't. It was just the way it looked. Thank you, Lord. There's also someone here who's got a problem in their jaw. Sometimes I get them backward and I get dyslexic, so I got to figure this out. Hold on. I think it's also on the left side. I don't know what's going on with the left side tonight. Um, but it's in your jaw, and there is something dealing with a tooth. Got them already, right there. So there's something dealing with the tooth, but it's not just your tooth. It's, there's some kind of misalignment or something. In, okay, that's you. All right, let's lay hands on this woman and have the Lord align her jaw. Thank you, Lord. Father, open the heavens and show her that you are still Yahweh Rapha. We speak to that jaw. We speak to it in the name of Jesus. <coughs> Receive the healing of the Lord. Become natural. And that corruption in that tooth, which is lingering and will not respond to normal dentistry, we command you, come into alignment and receive the Lord's healing. Receive healing in Jesus' name into the tooth. And jaw, align now with the kingdom of God. Align with the kingdom of God in Jesus' name. Now, before we turn this loose to a general... Oh, do you have a jaw back there? Is that Steve Haig? All right. Steve's one of our own. Let's uh, get a couple people on Steve and go after that jaw. He's ready to get healed. Watch this. He's ready to get healed. There it is. There's the power coming over his body right there. 
There it is, right there. Take it, Steve. Let it soak into you. Let it happen in Jesus' name. Oh, yeah. Crush him like a bug, Lord. That's what I'm talking about. Hallelujah.